this is in North America, uh, where I am, uh, and certainly other countries that use the same calendar, we're entering a new year. And a new year is an appropriate time to reflect on first principles, on the things that matter most, on the ways of being, really, that you can draw on again and again this year, in the year to come, as you deal with challenges and try to heal and grow and awaken along the way. So in the spirit of that fundamental beginning here, it's an appropriate time to consider this central question. What is it that leads to happiness and away from suffering for ourselves and others? What matters most? In the Buddhist teachings and in other spiritual traditions and in certainly practical psychology, uh, there's the foundational emphasis on an answer to this question, which essentially boils down in plain English, don't be a jerk. Or as purportedly the motto of Google is or was, don't be evil. Now, the Buddha put it more elegantly, and there are two quotations from the Dhammapada that, you know, say it in a nicer way. Here we go. Irrigators regulate the rivers. Fletchers straighten the arrow shaft. Carpenters shape the wood. The wise control themselves. Second, the wise are controlled in bodily action, controlled in speech, and controlled in thought. They are truly well controlled. So in the language of early Buddhism, this process um, of don't be a jerk and self-regulation is called sila. That's the language of early in the language of early Buddhism. Uh, the word sila gets translated in different ways, sometimes as restraint, other times as morality. I prefer the term virtuous conduct. That can, might sound kind of fancy, but it's basically simple. Uh, we are virtuous in simple everyday ways, in the choices we make, in our thoughts, words, and deeds. And when we're virtuous, we act more in ways that help, and we act less in ways that harm. Pretty straightforward. I'll get into the details of this a little later on, and then we'll certainly open it up for discussion. But here I'd like to establish the context for virtuous conduct. First, it is not about following a set of rules handed down from on high that would be a sin to violate. Virtuous conduct in this conduct in this context is about observing pragmatically the results of your actions and nudging yourself, including this year, away from what hurts and toward what helps. This is not about enacting the shoulds of others or being a kind of puppet controlled by the moral mandates of other people. This is about finding and resting in a sense of your own integrity, simple, sense of uprightness, integrity, and drawing on and living from the innate natural goodness in your own innermost being. That's what this is about. Second, virtuous conduct is something that we do both for the sake of others and for the sake of ourselves. Virtuous conduct has obvious benefits for them, and that's good. Meanwhile, it has tremendous benefits for you personally, including reducing conflicts with others, strengthening your general capacities for guiding and regulating yourself, and helping you to enjoy what the Buddha called whew, the bliss of blamelessness. A clear conscience, knowing in your heart you haven't strayed and that you've done what you could. In effect, virtuous conduct is a gift it's a gift you give yourself. To get a feeling for how the Buddha thought about this, here is a passage from the Anguttara Nikaya about the moral principle of not killing. Uh, and I've paraphrased it slightly. When people abandon the taking of life and abstain from taking life, they give freedom from danger, freedom from animosity, and freedom from oppression to limitless numbers of beings. In giving, 
freedom from danger, freedom from animosity, and freedom from oppression to limitless numbers of beings, they gain a share in limitless freedom from danger, freedom from animosity, and freedom from oppression. This is a great gift, original, long-standing, traditional, ancient, unadulterated, unadulterated from the beginning, that is not open to suspicion, will never be open to suspicion, and is unfaulted by knowledgeable contemplatives and teachers. Wow. Okay. And you see, as we um, treat others well, we partake in some ways in that good treatment in ways that help us too. Third, we develop, as you develop sila and virtuous conduct, sometimes what you face is how you haven't been so virtuous. That's definitely been true for me. Uh, you know, as we kind of walk the higher road, huh, we wince sometimes, sometimes very painfully when we consider things that we've said or done or thought uh, in times past. This is a natural process, and don't be afraid of it. It's okay to feel the remorse or the guilt, even the shame, and as appropriate, feel it, and as appropriate, do what we can about it. And that said, our virtuous conduct is about the present, and to a lesser extent, it's about the future. But it's particularly about what we do now. And whatever we've done in the past, we can take refuge in what we're doing now. We may have to deal with the consequences uh, including the reactions of other people to things we've done in the past. And they may be very painful and inescapable and nothing we can do about them, unfortunately. And still, meanwhile, we can know that at least in the present, we are not creating any more painful consequences for our self in the future and that we can rest in the uprightness and self-assurance and the dignity uh, of this knowing. Fourth, um, it is good to enjoy and appreciate your virtuous conduct. You know, three more quotations from the Dhammapada about this. The doer of good rejoices here and hereafter. One rejoices in both the worlds. This one and those mysterious other ones, maybe. One rejoices and exults, recollecting one's own pure deeds. Wow. I mean, sometimes Buddhism gets a knock as this kind of grim, dour, ascetic tradition, you know, suffer, die, repeat. Right? And, um, you know, here we have the Buddha basically exhorting us to appreciate your own goodness, appreciate your own sincere efforts. When you take the higher road, good on you. You know, it's okay to pat yourself on the back. You can uh, rejoice and exult, uh, recollecting your own pure deeds. Good. Now, why does he say that? Well, he says that because it helps us stay on the path. It's motivating uh, to do this. It helps us enjoy this process of virtuous conduct, which sometimes can be challenging. Another quotation. Of all the fragrances, sandal, tagara, whatever that is, blue lotus, and jasmine, the fragrance of virtue is the sweetest. Of all the fragrances, and I'll put these quotes in too, the, virtue of, the fragrance of virtue is the sweetest. And then the last quotation, well done is that action of doing which one repents not later, and the fruit of which one reaps with delight and happiness. Let's see here. Everyone in the meeting. Great. Okay, so that's the context. And last and not least, our virtuous conduct must be connected to and supported by two other things, training the mind and cultivating wisdom. Together, these are the three fundamental pillars of practice in the Buddhist tradition. In Pali, known as sila, samadhi, and panya. Virtuous conduct, mental training, and wisdom. These pillars are also found in other secular and spiritual paths, sometimes by different terms. So let's pause. Let's pause for a moment and take some stock, including as we 
enter into this new year. When you reflect on yourself these, these days, no praise or blame, just the facts, where are you at with virtuous conduct? What steps, what good steps are you already taking in what you do and what you don't do? Recognize that. And also, as you look to the year to come, is there anything that draws you in terms of uh, raising your game, uh, improving your own sila, being more consistent perhaps, or extending virtuous conduct into more spheres of your life. As you reflect here, does anything come to you that would be a good guiding principle for this year? If you want, you can make a note of it. You can make a mental note of it, if not in writing. And you can just kind of quietly commit, uh, know in your heart of hearts how you want to how you want to walk, how you want to conduct yourself in the year to come. Similarly, does anything draw you when you take stock? How are you doing with training your mind to be more mindful, concentrated, compassionate, and peaceful? Would it be appropriate maybe to meditate more often or to focus more on really being motivated toward concentration and deep steadiness of mind? And also, as you look out over the year to come, do you see anything about cultivating greater wisdom, including, you know, wisdom into the causes of happiness and the causes of the end of suffering? Do you want to maybe put yourself more in touch with sources of wisdom on a regular basis, maybe really participating in this uh, Wednesday meditation gathering consistently, maybe reading a little more, listening to other teachers, you know, hanging out with people who embody wisdom of one kind or another. Maybe that's something that would call to you this year. Maybe keeping a little wisdom journal, even just jotting down a word or a phrase every day that is for you a takeaway, a good teaching. So looking out at the year to come, any headlines already about these three major pillars of practice, sila, samadhi, and panya, virtuous conduct, mental training, including through meditation, and the cultivation of real wisdom. And now I'd like to focus on the details of virtuous conduct, details of sila. First, one way to frame our virtuous conduct is in terms of red lights, what we don't do. For example, in the Old Testament of the Bible, we have thou shalt not, repeated 10 times, various things. Uh, in the Buddhist tradition, the basic five precepts um, are stated in the negative form. Uh, basically, they tell you what not to do. Now, interestingly, just a bit about the precepts, they are presented typically in the form of, I undertake, I undertake the precept to. So it's an undertaking. It's a personal choice. It's a taking it on board and committing to it. I undertake the precept to. A precept could be understood as a rule, all right, but I think more broadly and, and honestly more helpfully, it can be understood as a standard or a value and an aspiration. Now, sometimes the word training is added. Is added. That's how I initially heard about the precepts, as in, I undertake the training precept too. I really like this. I like this addition because it emphasizes that the precept is a training. It's a process in which we develop ourselves in terms of mind and heart. And um, in effect, precepts are practical guides. They're practical guides to the good life. We undertake them not because they are right or a should and we're righteous about it, but because they've been shown to be effective and helpful. Now, Tanisaro Bhikkhu translates the five precepts in this way. I undertake the precept 
to refrain from destroying living creatures. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from incorrect speech. And I undertake the precept to refrain from intoxicating drinks and drugs which cause carelessness. I've put these into the chat. So let's pause again, and I'll slow it down. Just take a moment here in an open, not self-critical, honest and clear-eyed kind of way right now. Reflect on where you currently stand with these standards, these ways of conducting yourself, stated simply, not killing, not stealing, not hurting yourself or others, not mistreating yourself or others through sexuality, not lying, not speaking falsely, and not getting intoxicated one way or another. Where are you at? How are you doing? These days. And as you look at the year to come, is there anything that calls to you to be more consistent with or careful about? I think of the Buddha's last words, as best we know, and the wonderful translation of them from Stephen Batchelor. His last words, we think, were essentially, things fall apart. Tread your path with care. And in the word care, we have both conscientiousness and love, caring. So when you look out at the year to come, is there anything that calls to you to bring more care to? We can consider the precepts, for example, in subtle ways. For example, for the first one, we might choose to eat less meat or none at all and to disengage increasingly from the larger process of humans mistreating non-human animals. Second, you might think about not taking more than your share of the time or attention in a conversation or meeting. You might think about your position in society structurally, as I do, as a white, male, professional, I was older, uh, and, you know, not centering yourself in situations or interactions or workplace settings or online settings in ways that crowd out others who are less advantaged, less privileged from getting their own voice in the space. You might think about that in terms of the precept about not stealing. Also, third, subtly, you might think about not gazing at others in unwanted and sexualized ways. You might think about, fourth, being careful about exaggerations or overstatements when you talk or write. Being careful about words like always or never or an accusatory tone, or jumping to a hasty conclusion with some kind of indictment. It's so easy to do that in Twitter or online. And last, maybe as you look to the year to come, you might think about scrutinizing anything in the traditional phrase I really like, anything that clouds the mind and leads to heedlessness. including 
Things like getting caught up in resentful ruminations that cloud your mind and lead to heedlessness. So I'll pause here. As you just kind of think about, okay, the year to come, getting in touch with your own deep integrity and goodness. What calls to you? Maybe to refine, to up-level in some ways, perhaps, how you're being in the world, especially with other people. And to be clear, and this is partly a response to some things I've seen in the chat, um, we cannot escape deciding for ourselves what is virtuous. There's no escape from that responsibility, existential responsibility. Um, we can be guided to some extent by what other people think is virtuous, including the great teachers, saints, awakened beings throughout history and in the present, fine. But at the end of the day, it is your call because if it's not your call, it's not autonomously chosen. And it's, it's not virtuous conduct, certainly as it's understood in the Buddhist tradition. Um, and, and kind of knowing this also helps us not evade our personal responsibility by getting caught up in, well, they say this and they say that and moral relativism and who knows anyway and postmodernist kinds of thinking. Eh. The end of the day, do we feed children or not? At the end of the day, we kind of know how we land on other people and we know what our intentions were and we know even subtleties of how we talk and look and act. And we know for ourselves, we can know for ourselves what is virtuous conduct. We may refine that over time, fine, but still we have the ability, we have the right, and we have the responsibility to define for ourselves, okay, what is my personal code? How do I want to be in this world? There's no escape. It really is up to only you. Okay. And now I want to keep going and focus on sila, virtuous conduct, uh, in the frame of green lights. In other words, the precepts and other principles of virtuous conduct can be framed as things to support, things to do. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh has been a wonderful teacher of this approach, and I'll summarize and paraphrase his own restatement of the five precepts. I vow to practice reverence for life. I vow to practice generosity. I vow to practice sexual responsibility. I vow to practice deep listening and loving speech, deep listening and loving speech, and I vow to practice mindful consumption. Think about these positively framed um, virtues or precepts and um, think about them in the year to come. I vow to practice reverence for life. How might your day shift in even little ways if you practice reverence for life? How might your day shift, even in little ways, if you practice generosity, including with other people. Not the generosity that exhausts you or bankrupts you, but a generosity that's, that's there, the gift that can be given. How might that change your day and your year? I vow to practice sexual responsibility, including applied to yourself. Are there behaviors, are there thought processes that you know in your heart are not good for you? Or things that you know, are just not good for others. How might it feel really good? How might it be such a relief to 
give up maybe the small pleasures associated with that while experiencing the greater pleasures of what Thich Nhat Hanh calls sexual responsibility. Fourth, as you look to the year to come, what would it be like to practice deep listening and loving speech? I love that phrase, deep listening and loving speech, including with people you oppose, even vigorously. And last, as you look to the year to come, how might it shift tomorrow and the days after uh, if you vow to practice mindful consumption of intoxicants or substances, food, media, TV programs, political Twitter, in my case, uh, you know, spending time with people that are not good for you, shifting away disengaging from dead-end conversations, including negative gossip about other people. How might it make your day and your year better to practice mindful consumption? Okay. And then as we finish here, and we'll open it up for responses to um, some things that have been said in the chat sidebar and also hopefully talk with one or two people live at least. Um, you know, I want to just kind of step back from all this and say that um, if our principles of virtuous conduct are felt as a kind of nagging outside in, uh, felt as a kind of pressure or control or criticism, that feels stressful and burdensome and it's hard to sustain. It's much better to feel carried along by your heartfelt commitments, lifted by them and inspired by them. You can surrender to your commitments uh, of virtuous conduct and let them live through you. Let them be what are the driving forces of your actions, of thought, word, and deed. It's okay if you're not perfect. It really is. Um, take a look clearly, see what happened, learn, take a breath, whoosht, and reestablish yourself in sila. To paraphrase the great writer Samuel Beckett, as he said, fail, fail again fail better. Sila often is a matter of like riding a bike. We're always kind of tilting from one side to another, and that's okay. The process of correcting and proceeding is what it's really all about. Last, in many settings, people restate their vows or undertake certain precepts each day. Uh, I've done that on meditation retreats. Uh, I have friends who uh, live in monastic settings and do that sort of thing. And as a lay practitioner, I've uh, taken uh, precepts every day uh, in my own everyday life away from retreats. And you might consider establishing uh, your own list of heartfelt commitments. They might be the traditional five, five precepts. They might be just words. Perhaps there's an image. Uh, maybe a, a feeling in your body even that you just establish and commit to uh, as you begin your day, even before you get out of bed. Um, this can be really helpful, actually. Uh, it's kind of like aligning with uh, goodness, in effect, and being uh, kind of aligning with that current and being carried by it and establishing ourselves in it as we as we enter into our day. Uh, this approach has helped me a lot, and I think it would help you too. Okay. Uh, by the way, next week in my talk, I'm going to 
broaden this topic into the larger matter of non-harming, and in particular, looking at the forms of harms that we visit upon others and are often visited upon us of what's called externalizing costs. In other words, dumping our own messes or problems or pollution, et cetera, et cetera, downstream on other people, rather than taking responsibility for cleaning up our own messes. And this is really powerful material, it takes us into larger questions of engaged contemplative practice, engaged Buddhism, engaged whatever you'd like to say, and I'll be getting into that next week. Okay, for now, I want to take a look at your questions and comments about your own personal virtuous conduct and um, see what you've got to say about all this uh, as a way to lay a foundation for your happiness and your well-being and your effectiveness and success in this year. This is not about fault finding or any kind of naming and shaming. This is about, aha, living in alignment uh, with what's true and what will help you be happy uh, and awake this coming year. Okay. I see comments, very good. Uh, Margaret. Um, B makes a comment at 721 that <coughs> I'd like to speak to. It's really important. Margaret writes, sometimes speaking truthfully doesn't land in another person as inspirational. Uh, it can be downright disturbing. So great point and true. Sometimes our virtuous conduct is unwanted by other people. Maybe they're trying to suck us into their not virtuous conduct. Maybe our own virtuous conduct makes them feel guilty about their not-so-virtuous conduct. Maybe our own virtuous conduct uh, in, just implicitly involves a kind of an autonomous, independent stand for our own well-being and what we consider true and right, and they want to disempower us. They don't want us to be autonomous and clear-eyed and uh, straightforward. Uh, maybe they don't like our own virtuous conduct because it frankly, establishes a kind of base from which, with integrity and some moral authority, we can, as appropriate, uh, speak truth to power and comment on the not-virtuous conduct of others, including at larger political and societal and economic scales. So be it. Got it. Um, we can take that into account to some extent, including in practical ways when you're really outnumbered sometimes. But in general, our virtuous conduct is our own problem. It's our own responsibility. Their reactions to our virtuous conduct are their problem, their responsibility, and their existential, consequential, karmically saturated responsibility to establish themselves in virtuous conduct is their business. It's their business primarily and fundamentally. The Buddha was really crystal clear about including in his last words, you know, tread your path with care. It's your path and it's your responsibility to walk it with care. And he was also crystal clear that yes, to act with others in ways that are hopefully harmonious and certainly respectful and compassionate. But that said, at the end of the day, even if our words, thoughts, and deeds are unwanted. If in our own judgment they're appropriate, so be it. And as we judge best, we are free to act upon them. Okay. Great. All right. Anybody want to talk with me? Uh, if you raise your hand, go to the reactions button with the smiley face and a plus sign at the bottom of your Zoom window. Push that button and beep, you'll move to the front of the group in the Zoom windows. Um, if you have a particular question about SELA, and I really want to focus on your SELA, not other people's SELA. It's really tempting to talk about their virtuous conduct or getting them to act better. You know, I want to stay away from that. I want to focus here on, you know, you. What seems important for you? Okay. So I'm going to call on, I'm going to try to get to, 
Madison, and I see two Lisas, all right? So I'm going to probably have to call the line right there. Uh, and so you know, um, as I say, I read all the chats, so I will eventually read everything you've written, and I will receive it. I may not be able to respond to it, but I'll definitely receive it. Okay, I'll start with my friend Madison. So Madison, I'm asking you to unmute. As usual, keep it short, please. Keep it focused on what we're talking about here. I say that to everybody. Happy New Year, Rick. Okay, I can keep it really short. These are the the five things of the five precepts. Probably two or three of them bug me, but the two that I'll mention that are problems for me. Uh, one seems more superficial. The first one is bugs, literally bugs. I, I work as an organizer and I do kill bugs. And I think about the Buddhist stuff and ushering them out and maybe have some new thoughts on on bugs. It, it, in a sense, it sounds superficial, but if it gets mentioned as a Buddhist precept, then I guess it's not quite so superficial. And then the other one that's really a challenge for me is being instantly reactive much of the time. And despite tons of years of personal growth and many times a week of meditating, of just having a very quick trigger response. So there they are. All right. I appreciate you saying it. Well, the one about um, killing bugs, and which then kind of extends often into choosing to eat meat. And by meat, I mean really uh, the, you know, fish, uh, milk products, you know, to consume milk products inherently involve uh, the death of the male born cows, goats, and sheep inevitably because they can't make milk. And so if we consume milk, we partake in that process. So it's, it's really, it's a large, large question and one that um, I'm certainly no authority on. Uh, the Dalai Lama has been asked about that. He comes from a Tibetan culture in which it's hard to grow non-meat-based sources of food, for example. What do we do? I, I have friends who, like Leslie Booker, who I've learned a lot from, actually a wonderful teacher, uh, I learned a lot from about uh, you know, the practice of sila and using it for healing and, and growing in a very deep way. Um, she says herself that uh, she just needs animal protein. And I, I can understand this. So it, it's very, very complicated. Where I think it's helpful is to focus on maybe three things in particular. One is, what's our intent? What's our attitude? Is there hostility toward the bugs, for example? Are we acting out of hostility? Now, there may be hostility. They may give us the creeps. They may bother us. But at the end of the day, are we acting from hatred? That's problematic. Second, Thing we can keep in mind is we can harm less. We can harm less. Uh, you know, meatless Fridays, uh, shifting away from cattle, let's say, which have a lot of you know consequences in terms of global warming. Maybe to other sources of protein. Uh, being thoughtful about this, reducing harms when you can, ushering spiders out of your house rather than squashing them. Uh, finding other ways, maybe, to discourage pests from you know, being in certain places where they're unwanted. Reducing harms. Maybe we can't eliminate all harms, but we can reduce harms. And then third, really looking hard at the things we do just for our convenience. You know, as individuals, we can, we can just become very self-centered and entitled. And as a species, wow, human beings, I've sure acted in self-centered and entitled ways vis-a-vis -vis the whole natural world and for their own convenience, for their own convenience, way beyond the immediacies of keeping themselves alive and their children alive, you know, to live to see the sunrise. Convenience. So that's a that's a that's one to really think about. Uh, briefly, reactivity, that's a huge topic, you know. Um, and uh, I think that uh, it's helpful to really take uh, comfort in the fact that you've practiced your heart out, Madison. You know, I know you. You've practiced. Uh, I won't use any vulgar expressions, but you've practiced your heart out. And uh, just know that, right? And at the end of the day, we have the temperaments we do sometimes. And often those temperaments are shaped by life experiences. 
They are what they are. And as best we can, again, less harming, right? Just reduce harm reduction. Maybe we can't stop that reactivity in the first few seconds, but we can act it out less. Maybe we can, you know, come out of a reactivity cascade after, you know, 30 seconds rather than 31, and then 29 seconds and 28. I mean, harm reduction. I would do that. And then otherwise, just, just keep practicing, uh, you know, even for other reasons besides reducing reactivity. Okay, I hope that was that was helpful. All right, you take good care, Madison. Really, you're, you're great. I dig you. All right, good. Okay, Lisa, the Lisa who has the hand up here. I'm asking to unmute. I'm going to go a couple minutes over, and then we'll wrap up in a couple of minutes. So, Lisa, do you want to? Hi there. Mm-hmm. Yep. Hi. Do you want to turn your camera on? I am very shy. Okay, then don't. Okay. Thank you kindly. It's my honor and privilege, my first time asking, right. and I will just sum it up, and I would so appreciate your thoughts. Yeah. Um, I'm a meditator learning to meditate. I mainly do moving meditation with Tai Chi, but learning to sit. Right. Um, I have a situation with a friend who is a beloved friend and has just joined, uh, invited me to join a wine club. And in this time of isolation, how lovely to see beloved friends. Um, I personally have come off a journey of learning not to harm myself and others. So I reverse type two diabetes and I no longer uh, eat animal products. Um, I am, it's very- Do you have a question about the wine club? Yes, it's very valuable for me, deep listening and loving speech, how to approach yeah. Without making my friend feel judged or looked down upon. Sure. Because recently learning, she she recently lost her sister a few years ago to breast cancer and learning how much wine affects breast cancer uh, and that it is a class one carcinogen. Yeah. You know, just just like right. processed lunch meat so or other things. Are you grappling um, with what to say to your friend or yes. a, about so, her joining the club or explaining your reasons for not joining the club? Or are you grappling me. with whether to join it at all? She invited me and I would love to see them and join with oh. my own beverage. I'm considering yeah. telling a bit of a white lie and saying for medical reasons or I'm allergic sure. or... I mean, what are your thoughts? I'm okay. walking the truth line because I want it to be loving connection. Thank you so much. Oh, it's really good. And I appreciate you tolerating my kind of interruptions here just in the interest of time and my own clarity. Well, there's a little bit of an ambiguity in the poly of the intoxication precept, the fifth precept. And one way to understand it is that it's a straight prohibition on intoxicants, straight up particularly drugs and alcohol, uh, you know, do not consume drugs and alcohol because they cloud the mind and lead to heedlessness. That's one way of understanding it. Another way, which opens a bit of a door, is do not consume intoxicants that cloud the mind and lead to heedlessness. And I know people, including, um, you know, some well-known Buddhist teachers who will partake of um, different intoxicants, um, including sometimes psychedelic intoxicants, that do not, for them, cloud their mind and lead to heedlessness. It's a bit of a slippery slope. Uh, The brain likes these molecules and starts justifying participation with them. But there's that opening there that makes it really, brings the responsibility back to us, actually, which is good to recognize what helps and what hurts and what's good for oneself. So that's kind of a context here. Uh, With regard to explaining it to others, I think that, uh, you know, we have the right to explain or we have the right to say whether we'll participate or not. We have the right to explain it or not. I read once that Miss Manners, Miss Manners, that great authority on polite behavior, said that you never have to give a reason for declining an invitation. You don't have to explain why. You may choose to, but you don't have to. And if people get pushy about wanting to know why, well, that's their problem. That's their problem. That's not your problem. Uh, so that, and then in terms of, uh, you know, 
whether or not you want to say something to another person, it's really complicated. The science on casual, mild, you know, mild consumption of alcohol is complicated. There are complex studies that show that there's no safe lower bound. In other words, that there's risk. Uh, there's no amount of consuming alcohol that is without statistical risk. Now, you may dodge those bullets. Those risks might increase the chance of a significant illness, including a life-ending cancer, uh, by, you know, from, you know, might increase that risk by 1%, perhaps, but that's still a risk, and there's there's no zero bound underneath it all. So it's it's complicated. It's a complicated thing. Um, at the end of the day, I'll just maybe finish on this point. I think it's really important in the consideration of of sila and virtuous conduct to keep coming back to what's your why. Such a fundamental question. What's your why? What's your why? in the good sense of the virtues, the standards, the, the principles, the truths that you want to live more and more in alignment with. Those kind of whys. Why are you saying it? Why are you doing it? Why are you thinking it? What's, what are the good whys, the good reasons that you can find and establish yourself in? That's really good. On the other hand, what's the why uh, behind different kinds of reactivity or different kinds of behavior, getting buzzed, acting out sexually, uh, sneaking glances, stealing, in effect, at what other people are doing when it's really their private business? What's your why? Casually consuming meat that inevitably involves killing other sentient beings, other living things. What's your why? Just stepping on a spider, squashing a bug. What's your why for that? And the exploration of sila, the exploration of virtuous conduct, is an incredible teacher, you know, right in the middle of everyday life uh, that draws us to clarity about what our whys are and how to increasingly disengage from problematic whys and rest increasingly in the ones that are most wholesome, most conducive to our own happiness, and most conducive to our own awakening. So with that said, let's just take a moment to kind of let it all sink in. 